the simulation. If you compare that with, say, the integral of the modulus of j cross b of phi, which gives you something which you'd expect to be of the magnitude, that is typically quite small. I mean, it's a dimensionless quantity, which is typically sort of 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2 in these models, showing you that they're at least making an attempt to, uh, to get to Taylor's constraint. The problem is, of course, in the models, this term, which is negligible in the core, is actually non-negligible. And indeed, these terms actually are also non-negligible as well. So that's the J.B. Taylor's constraint. So one can imagine a situation where uh, J.B. Taylor's constraint is, is, is imposed, is, is true, yeah, where the J and the B happen, and you're in magnetostrophic balance, that is to say, the Coriolis force, the pressure force, and the Lorentz force are all in balance. And then you could ask yourself, well, suppose I perturb that state, what will happen? Well, I'll get some waves in the core, of course. So let's start looking at waves in the core. So I'm going to write u is e to the i k x minus omega t. I'm going to ignore all nonlinear terms, because that's what you do when you look at waves. So we look at the linearized, full linearized equations, that's the whole of this lot, and we just bung that ansatz in there. T goes like t naught times x of i k x minus omega t, and so does little b here. This b naught is the imposed magnetic field, mean magnetic field we're thinking of. And if you do that, uh, it's quite a fiddle actually doing it, but it's well worth doing, and the result's very interesting. Uh, you get this dispersion relation, which is called the Mach wave dispersion relation. Um, actually, if we've ignored buoyancy here, so this is just the MC part of it, M for magnetic, C for Coriolis, A for Archimedean, to get you a, a pronounceable word. So this is without the buoyancy in. Um, so just the MC, which is the simpler slightly version, you get this quadratic equation for omega, well, it's a quartic equation for omega squared, but it's, uh, omega squared is the variable, so you can solve it as a quadratic. Uh, and you end up with omega is sort of plus or minus all this, but that doesn't make any difference because that just changes the direction of, of the k and the, the omega. So basically, the, 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 this one here really does make a difference. You can either choose the plus sign or the mi minus sign in that quadratic equation, and you get two completely different types of wave depending on whether you choose the plus or the minus. If you choose the plus, then this one here is in planets, this is a lot smaller than that. So typically then this is pretty negligible and you get an omega c which goes like that. So that's the kz, that's omega kz over mod k, that's the same essentially as we had before. Um, that's the inertial wave dispersion relation. Um, those are waves which are going to be of the frequency of the rotation period of the Earth, they're going to be hours. But if you take the minus sign, you get much more interesting things happening because then the big terms cancel and you end up with this here, yeah, which is, uh, you end up, sorry, with this, omega mc, which is omega m squared over omega c, which has got this thing here. Now that is quite slow. In, in the Earth's core, this is the thing which is believed to be sort of uh, five years, something like that. Uh, well, two pi over five years. This is something like two pi over a few days. So this is enormously smaller than that. Uh, and so this thing here is really rather small because it's got a small omega m and then it's multiplied by omega m over omega c. So that actually has got a period of sort of thousands of years. So these are really, really slow waves. And these are magnetostrophic waves. What are happening there is that the uh, inertia term is quite small in these things. And it's all a balance between uh, 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 Coriolis and Lorentz. And the time dependence is coming in the induction equation. It's the, the I omega appears in the dB by dt term. That's where the I omega is actually appearing. And the other I omega in the du by dt, that can be thrown away. That's of no significance. So that gives you this, these slow uh, MC waves. And those are quite important because these are sort of time scales which we might hope to see. These are things which are going to be visible in the secular variation, hopefully. Uh, right. So let's see, there are some special ones. Uh, the most special one of all, actually, is what happens if you make omega dot k exactly zero? 
So omega dot k corresponds to precisely geostrophic motions. The only precisely geostrophic motions are these alphane uh, oscillations. So basically everything's got to, got to be no vortex stretching. And if you're going to have no vortex stretching, then all you can do, really, is just move the fluid along on these cylinders. But you can have one cylinder going like that, and another cylinder going like that. And these motions have omega dot k equals naught precisely. They're exactly geostrophic. So if we look at our little dispersion relation, uh, that tells us that these are all naught, so we just get this one. So we just get an omega going like omega m. So for the very special case, omega dot k equals naught for these geostrophic motions, these torsional oscillations, they just go with the alphane wave. And that's the one which has got this five-year period. And these are these torsional oscillations, which, um, well, Andy Jackson mentioned these in the data. So Gillet has got these beautiful pictures, and the length of day has got a signal at that speed. So that's where the maths uh, links up with that. These are all the omega dot k's. Those are the special torsional oscillations. Those are the ones which go at frequency omega m. So those are interesting. So we think we've seen those. And uh, uh, sort of, so those are definitely part of the story and likely part of the story in all planets, I think. Uh, but there are other ones which are interesting. These are called magnetic Rossby waves. And I'll just explain what a magnetic Rossby wave is. Um, so they're basically things with this special dispersion relation. But what we want to do now is we're saying, well, a thousand years, that's rather a long time. The data, sig the, the data pattern that people have got it goes back to um, the invention of the compass, well, uh, the, the use it, useful of me recording of compass measurements, which is about 300 years. So we'd much rather look at waves which had a frequency of 300 years or less. So we want to get them a bit faster. So how do we get them faster? Well, we make that as small as possible. So how do we make that as small as possible? Well, we make that as small as possible by making omega dot k as small as possible. Now, not zero, because then we're back to the torsional oscillations. But then we can ask ourselves, are there any motions in the core which don't do much vortex stretching, uh, but do a little bit of vortex stretching, so we can get away from just moving purely on the, uh, the torsional alphane waves? And the answer is yes, because if you had a little columnar motion that was going around like that, yeah, it, it does do some stretching at the boundary, because, of course, as it moves out inwards, it's going to stretch its column a bit, and it's going to compress its column a bit, and backwards and forwards. So it's doing a bit of stretching, but not very much. So that omega dot k is going to be fairly smallish. So omega c here is going to be quite small. So that's going to give us a slightly bigger frequency. So we can hope to get down to hundreds of years for these magnetic Rossby waves. So these slow um, Rossby waves are called magnetic Rossby waves. The ordinary Rossby waves are the things I talked about in the Busser annulus. Those are the things that are going around and around with a, f a frequency in uh, roughly of the order of, of, the, uh, of, of the omega. Oh, it's actually omega to the two-thirds times the viscous scale, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a much faster than, than these things. And these ones go westward rather than eastward. So non-magnetic Rossby waves we saw went eastward in planetary cores, but the magnetic one Rossby waves, these go westward. So that may well, one sort of thinks, gosh, westward drift. We know that things sort of move westward. So perhaps actually if things are actually moving westward, perhaps we're actually seeing magnetic Rossby waves in their core. Well, I don't think anybody's an ambiguously seen magnetic Rossby waves. In the talk I'm giving next Tuesday, I'll be talking a little bit more about that and about the observational evidence and so on uh, of magnetic Rossby waves. And we've also done some numerical simulations which we see magnetic Rossby waves in. So we're sort of beginning to know what we're looking for. And that's uh, an ac active area that we're actually going on. Now I'm going to get on just to say 10 minutes of just dynamo models, some of the numerical results. And I'm going to go fairly quickly through this and just show you a lot of pictures. I'm not going to tell you at all how these numerical dynamos actually work. I'm assuming that Emmanuel is going to do that uh, to actually explain how you go about writing one of these codes. They're very long. They're very complicated. You don't do it on a Saturday afternoon. It's <laughs> uh, but there are one or two things you need to know before you ever even start. And um, that is the reason why people are doing these three-dimensional convective simulations is because no dynamo can be maintained by a planar flow. It would be much nicer if it was. 
if a nice, simple, two-dimensional flow could, could become a dynamo, that would be great. But unfortunately, Zeldovich proved that uh, it never works. Uh, so no restriction is placed on whether the field is 2D or not. Any, field, any flow like that is never going to be a dynamo. Cowling's theorem tells you that an axisymmetric magnetic field vanishing at infinity cannot be maintained by dynamo action. If you want a proof of these statements, look at my Lesouch notes. It's all written out, so line by line in there. Not as neat as Chandrasekhar, of course, <laughs> but my sort of attempt, <laughs> rather poor attempt to model his style. Uh, so th there you can see, uh, see that uh, in the Lesouch lecture notes. And... Uh, but, yeah. it's good. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's Cowling's theorem, yes. And similar, a, pyroid, a purely toroidal flow, that's one with the U of that form there, where that's a special type of velocity field, that can't maintain a dynamo either. So we know that these simple systems are, are never going to work. So that's basically why, we, if you're going to do dynamo simulations, you've really got to go to three dimensional computing. And that's expensive. Uh, but it is becoming possible now. So, as I say, in the Earth's core, the field is, is basically um, uh, clearly 3D. So these are some results. I'll just go through these very quickly now. So this is at Prandtl number one. This is, these are popular choices because it's sort of somehow obvious. Uh, that's a moderately, that would be a Rayleigh number. Uh, it depends how you define the Rayleigh number. Different people define it in slightly different ways. That's about ten times critical, I think. And that's a moderate at Ekman number 10 to the minus 4. And the mag that's a radial magnetic field. You can see, if you remember Andy Jackson's pictures, it's a lot too symmetric. The Earth's core is much more of a mess than that. Um, but it's nevertheless, it's generating a dipole field. Um, uh, so it's sort of got, got it, it's right to sort of zeroth order. Um, this one's got no internal heating. It's, it is entirely heated by the, uh, driven by buoyancy from the inner core boundary, which we think is probably right. It's got fixed temperature boundary conditions. Those have been criticized. People think the fixed flux boundary condition on the outside is probably better. Um, but we, we've done some, of course, we've done lots of, fixed, people have done lots of fixed flux ones too. It's very dipolar. It doesn't reverse. There are these rather unpleasant little items down here, which seem to never turn up in the earth. Uh, uh, magnetic field, but there you go. But so nevertheless, I mean, he's got some quite nice features. Even this one, we can see these, oops, some of the good features. Nice strong field patches up at the tangent cylinder. If you remember, Andy Jackson pointed to the, uh, those big lobes over Canada and Siberia in the geomagnetic field, and relatively weak uh, in the North Pole. That turns up in these dynamo models, too, because these are the strong patches there. So even in these rather simple dynamo models, that tends to, tends to feature. And it's easy to understand, too. It's because of the Brown and Taylor theorem doesn't like columns going over that inner core because then you can't have Z-independent motions. You can have Z-independent motions just close to that inner core, and that's where these columns like to live, and those columns are really what are generating this field. So those rotating columns of convection spiraling upwards that spiraling is very good for kind of dynamos and the velocity field that corresponded to that well there we are it's got um, columnar structures uh, so it's got all the same features as the linear theory had so I mean that's what I meant when you, I said always look at linear theory first because it will tell you things even about fully nonlinear, really complicated uh, simulations you'll see features which you recognize from linear theory in there. So there are some columnar stru structures, uh, the intense flux patches at the top of the columnar rolls, yeah, so up here, that's what I was saying. And the pattern generally propagates westward, which is sort of what, what the, the real thing does. Um, what happens if you go away from Rossby numbers that are small to Rossby numbers that are much bigger? So we're now increasing the Rayleigh number here. Uh, keeping the Ekman number the same. So that means, if you remember the picture I had about the Nusselt number versus Rayleigh number picture, we're now moving on to the non-rotating part of the branch. So by just by increasing the Rayleigh number, keeping the Ekman number fast, you're getting away from the rotating branch. The columnar structures are all breaking up, and the magnetic field also breaks up, and it's much less dipolar. 
is what we call, sometimes call a small-scale dynamo. There's, in, in the planetary literature, it's often called multipolar dynamos. In the astrophysical literature, it's a small-scale dynamo. It's all the same thing. It's just lots and lots of small-scale field with no overall mean field, no coherent structure. And that's what you get. So that's telling us that the rotation is very important for organizing the field in order to get large-scale structures. Without the, magnetic, without the rotation, you don't get um, uh, large-scale dipolar-type fields. And the flow, well, there you see sort of bits of columnar structure still there, but basically it's a mess. Um, and that's basically what's happening as you increase. You get more activity at the poles, less columnar uh, rolls, and that's basically what happens. Now, this is quite a nice little picture of Uli Christiansen's uh, and Julian Aubert. Um, it's a map in magnetic parental number and in radio over critical, and uh, we're looking at different Ekman numbers. So we're going down and down and down and down and down in Ekman number towards the Earth's core values or planetary core values. Okay, so um, here we get the dipolar ones, provided the radio number is not too big and the magnetic parental number is quite large. Uh, up here, right down here, is much more promising. We can get dynamos at small Ekman number when the rotation is very dominant. So we've got these very organized columnar structures. Uh, you can get dipolar dynamos uh, up to quite large values of the Rayleigh number and up to, down to quite small values of the magnetic parental number. So there doesn't seem to be too much difficulty. If you imagine extrapolating this off in the direction of the Earth's core, we seem to be getting very dipolar and we seem to be getting okay with the magnetic parental number. So that's no fundamental difficulties. Uh, no. Uh, oh, well, um, now, that messy one, I mean, it's hard to say whether it's reversing or not because you really, can't really define a sense of a dipole. If you just look at the dipole component, it's fluctuating all over the place, but then so is every other component. The other one is not reversing. The, the one I showed you before is actually, that one is rock steady, actually. That won't ever reverse. Um, if you want to get something that reverses, what you have to do is you have to find a rotation rate which is somehow just in between uh, this mess and the very, very columnar structure. So basically the way people have found reversing dynamos is uh, bump the Rayleigh number up a bit so that then the columnar structure isn't quite as columnar, uh, but it's still columnar enough to generate a dipolar field. But then, the, because it's a mess, sometimes uh, quadrupolar bits will come in and then sometimes it'll reverse. And that, so there's a sort of reversing zone in these dynamo models which just exactly lies in this local Rossby number 0.1. If you're smaller than that, it's steady, rock steady, rotation dominated. If you're a bit higher than that, it's a mess. But just on that critical strip, then you can get reversing dynamos. And those are the, and that's all the current reversing dynamos are, are like that. I mean, that's, that's where they all are. Um, yeah. Okay, here's a, a much smaller uh, uh, Ekman number dynamo. And you can see the columns are getting thinner exactly like you'd expect. Uh, this one is the radial velocity at 0.5. If you go out to the surface, uh, the columns get even thinner there. So there are lots of really quite thin structures there. And that's because the Ekman numbers got really quite low in that one. So on the magnetic field, uh, well, there's some scale separation beginning to show there. So that's the vorticity pattern over there. That's the magnetic field pattern there. It's still quite a mess, but nevertheless you can see that it's on a much larger scale uh, than that one, which is what you'd expect at low magnetic parental number. Okay, I think, I think that might be a good place to stop, actually, because we, we're going to have lunch, aren't we, now, yes? So I don't want to overrun. So in, in the notes, these notes will all go up on the, on, the, on the web, of course, and I'll just tell you a bit about the actual things that I haven't actually covered, which are in the notes. So we're going to look at the scaling laws for magnetic field strength. So the bottom line there is you can get a field, um, a measure of B star in terms of the heat flux, and you can compare that uh, with Jupiter and uh, the Earth and other planets. And it seems to do a reasonably good job. I mean, if you put all these parameters in, you get sort of sensible values of B star out. But with all these things, I mean, 
an awful lot of the fundamental physics isn't really quite right yet, so I'm quite sure these things will change in time. And I'm equally sure that lots of people are going to be working on this in the next 10, 15 years, trying to improve these things, and I'm sure they will improve them. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on that. And then there's some analastic stuff, and I'm, I'm not going to go into that now, because but if you look at it uh, on the web, you'll see uh, how you do analastic convection and some of the results which have come out of analastic models, some of the new results that come out of analastic models. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah. So you mentioned that these uh, geomagnetic reversals are possible only in the narrow region of the parameter space. That's right. So, yep. So, so for some reason, uh, the Earth happens to be in that narrow region well, of the parameter uh, space, or what? Uh, well, or what? Yes. Well, uh, I think this is, illustrates mainly our, our lack of understanding of actually what's actually happening, because not only is there only, I mean. It could be just that the Earth just happens to be sitting in that. I mean, it is possible. I mean, it could just happen to have the Rossby number, which is appropriate for that. It could be just an accident, and that other planets don't reverse because they don't happen to be sitting there. But there is a snag with this, which I haven't mentioned, which is if you actually look at the value of the Rossby number or the local Rossby number um, based on the column width there, um, it's about 0.1 there. But actually, in the core, it's, uh, if you actually put the values that Andy Jackson mentioned in, it's much smaller. So not only does the, uh, is there only a narrow strip, but the Earth is actually not sitting in that narrow strip. So um, the Earth should not be reversing according to these dynamo models. Um, now, what's gone wrong? Well, probably we're still in this regime where the, the viscosity is affecting the convection. We haven't got our Ekman numbers small enough so that we're dominated by magnetic fields. I mean, I think we all really be believe that although you'll get some flux expulsion from these, these cores, eventually the magnetic field will get into those columns and that will then change the size and thickness of the columns and that's not really happening in the dynamo models that we have at the moment. It's sort of beginning to happen in some of them. Uh, so I think we're, we're moving in the right direction, but I mean, I, we haven't really got there. Um, unfortunately, all the dynamo models where we've got a low enough Ekman number to see the magnetic field taking over, these take years or many, many weeks at least to run. And so it's just not possible to explore the reversal behavior because to explore the reversal behavior, you have to integrate these things for a very long time. And it's just not possible. So I'm afraid the rather unsatisfactory situation is that we have models which actually reverse, but they're definitely not quite the right physics because they're not actually lying in that crucial strip. They're, they're somewhat displaced from that crucial strip. So clearly there is some physical mechanisms going on which is broadening that strip. I'm sure that's actually what's happening. I'm sure that if you actually got the magnetic field to really affect the convection, that that strip, instead of being relatively small, would, would start to open up, and then it becomes much more plausible that the Earth is actually sitting in that strip. Yeah, thanks. Good use, question. Uh, simulations of dynamos, do you start with some initial configuration? Um, well, um, I've done, we've done quite a lot of different ones. I mean, basically, what we do is, is run from a very small field. So typically, uh, what we'll do is do some runs where you start from a very small magnetic field with all the wave numbers in all, or all the spherical harmonics in, uh, and it, but put some temperature and some magnetic field in there, and then let it grow. And then, it, because it's past the critical re re magnetic Reynolds number, then the field grows and then it saturates. So that's the right thing to do, and we've certainly done some of the right thing to do. Um, of course, it, it's much easier just to take the previous run and then just uh, change the parameters and then uh, run it on the, uh, the next time. And that's sort of all right, but of course you can miss things like subcritical behavior if you do that. So you've got to be a bit careful in, in doing that. So the starting point, you've got to be, you really do need to do at least some runs where you're starting from a small, uh, small um, Yeah, I mean, but on the other hand, uh, you could have different dynamic behavior if you started with a strong 
Oh, yeah, yeah, you can get subcritical behavior. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it's certainly... In fact, that, that's, quite, that's quite normal, in fact. I mean, uh, I would say that's, that's more, more common than not, that, uh, that um, you can get magnetic fields, stable, strong magnetic fields, at the same values of the parameters at which the small field won't grow. No, that's subcritical behavior. Well, yeah, yeah there, sure, yeah. It's not necessary that I mean, uh, that's, yeah, and that's, I mean, well, I mean, the solar magnetic field is presumably as, as old as the sun, maybe even older in the sense that it was probably a magnetic field in the accretion disk, I would think. Yeah. So that would act as a seed field for a dynamo. I think, yeah, I think which maybe may address part of the question is that the PRM is very moderate in the Earth, so mm -hmm. the notion of eigenmodes makes much more sense than less yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question about practical implementation. You briefly mentioned MPI as a rule in this course. Yes. So, what are the tools of choice and the computational setup? Well, the computational setup, well, I think Emmanuel will, will, will describe it. Basically, um, from the mathematical point of view, everything is expanded in spherical harmonics, yes. And we use what's called the pseudo spectral method. You may, may have come. You may have come across this. But, um, so it's basically a, 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 a numerical technique for integrating the equations forwards in time. Then these things are typically run on clusters. And, well, it depends on who you are, I guess, how many processes you're actually using. But, I mean, typically, I suppose 500 would be sort of... I, mean, I don't know how many processes you were using. But the, the, the analytic calculations which I was using, I was using up to 1,000 processes. And I presume Shaco was using one to two thousand processors, yes. So basically you've got to distribute the workload over the spherical harmonics. So basically some of the spherical harmonics. Uh, well, there's also the radial mesh points. And the, the, the beginning, yeah, well, the, yeah, at the beginning we kept ugh, about, a, well, a hundred would be good. It's quite often less than L equals M equals a hundred. Um, um, well, it depends on the Ekman number and the Rayleigh number. I mean, that prevents you to going from very high Rayleigh numbers because if you go to very high Rayleigh numbers, then you, you fail to converge, basically. And the same thing happens with very small Ekman numbers, too. You fail to converge. So, I mean, I would say up to about 100 points. About 100, L equals M, M equals 100. And typically, slightly less, usually, radial grid points, but, but of the order of 100 radial grid points. So, I mean, the first thing we used to do is we used to put each radial grid point on one processor and do all the L's and M's on, um, on that. But then when we got more processors, we had more processors than grid points. So then we had to split the L and M up uh, across the processors, and so that's been done. And there are various different ways of doing that, actually. Where that, uh, I think there's quite a bit of discussion going on about the best way to do that. But yeah, so that's, that's it, yeah. Okay, so we'll stop more discussion at lunch. Yep, okay. very good. Thanks again. Thank you very much.